May 27, 1997, in Jarrell, Texas, it looked like any other humid afternoon. Forecasters saw weak upper-level winds and issued a routine tornado watch. But brewing above was the most unstable atmosphere Texas had ever seen, a convergence of a cold front and a gravity wave setting the stage. No one expected a storm to drift the wrong way or to become an F5 that would erase an entire neighborhood. How did a day that should not have been deadly set a new standard for disaster? The answer starts with what most experts missed. Atmospheric profiles from that morning painted a picture at odds with the calm. High above Texas, winds were light, with the upper-level flow barely nudging the air. Meteorologists studying the soundings noted the absence of the classic jet stream punch that usually drives spring tornado outbreaks. Yet, at the surface, the ingredients simmered to an extreme. Dew points climbed into the upper 70s degrees Fahrenheit, saturating the air with gulf moisture. Surface-based convective available potential energy, called CAPE, the measure of how much energy a parcel of air could unleash, soared from 5,000 to 6,500 joules per kilogram. These numbers placed the day among the most unstable environments ever recorded for a Texas tornado, rivaling the top five days in American severe weather history. Forecasters at the Storm Prediction Center weighed these contradictions. The textbook cues for a major tornado event, strong wind shear, and deep layer forcing were missing, but the thermodynamic profile was explosive. The cold front sagged south and drew a sharp boundary through central Texas. A meso-low, subtle but potent, lingered near Waco. Then a gravity wave, rarely seen in the region, rippled southwestward and stacked the deck further. Where these features converged, the atmosphere was primed to erupt, even if the upper winds whispered rather than roared. By midday, the Storm Prediction Center issued Tornado Watch number 338 at 12.54 p.m., covering East Texas and Western Louisiana. The watch text reflected the uncertainty. While deep layer shear was not impressive, the buoyancy was off the charts. Any storm that could anchor itself along a boundary had access to fuel capable of rapid, violent growth. Analysts flagged the risk for isolated but potentially significant tornadoes, even as guidance models downplayed the threat. The sense among forecasters was uneasy. Some recalled later that the boundaries and instability were so pronounced they could not ignore the potential despite what the model said. The recipe was not classic, but it was volatile in a way that defied easy prediction. If a storm found the right focus, if it rooted itself on the boundary, the results could be severe. That tension lingered over the region as the afternoon wore on, unseen by most, but not by those reading the data. At 12.54 p.m., the Storm Prediction Center issued Tornado Watch number 338. The language was measured, but the numbers behind it were anything but ordinary. The watch covered East Texas and Western Louisiana, yet its real focus sharpened on a small patch of Central Texas, where boundaries had stacked up through the morning. The forecast team kept a close eye on radar screens as the early afternoon unfolded. Just before noon, near Waco, the first storm of the day began to take shape. It wasn't a sprawling outbreak, just a single stubborn cell, anchored at the intersection of the cold front and the meso-low. Satellite and radar images captured its first echoes as it blossomed along the boundary, feeding off the sky-high instability that had been building since sunrise. Unlike most Texas storms, which usually charge northeast, this one drifted southwest at a crawl, barely five miles per hour. Local meteorologists noticed the odd motion right away. The cell seemed glued to the boundary, refusing to break free. That tethering effect kept it locked in the zone of deepest moisture and energy, drawing fuel from the same pool hour after hour. The gravity wave rolling in from the northeast added an extra push, holding the storm in place and slowing its forward progress even further. Forecasters in regional offices traded updates, noting the cell's persistence and its refusal to dissipate or speed up. On radar, the updrafts pulsed but never waned. The environment was primed for something rare, a storm that could sit and strengthen rather than race away. The mesoscale discussion that accompanied watch number 338 made clear that, while the upper-level winds weren't impressive, the local ingredients were enough to support a rotating storm if it could stay rooted. 
Every new scan reinforced the point. This was no ordinary thunderstorm. For the next several hours, that lone supercell would become the main character in the day's unfolding story. Its slow, boundary-tied motion set the stage for everything that followed. As the afternoon sun climbed higher, the storm's southwest drift carried it closer to the heart of Williamson County, drawing the attention of every forecaster tracking its progress. The sense of anticipation grew with each radar sweep, a single cell moving against the grain, holding the potential for something extraordinary. At 3.25 p.m., the calm in Williamson County broke. Volunteer spotters relayed the first report. A tornado had touched down north of Jarrell. This was not the monster that would later flatten Double Creek Estates, but a brief, fierce F2 tornado that tore across open fields for eight minutes. Its path was short, but the violence was unmistakable. Fences twisted, a few trees snapped, and dust spiraled almost lazily in the humid air. The warning sirens sounded, echoing across farmsteads and the edge of town. Ten minutes later, a second tornado spun down, this time showing a fractured multi-vortex structure. Storm chasers described it as a snarl of rope-like funnels weaving around each other, briefly touching ground before vanishing into the haze. This tornado, also rated near F2 intensity, lasted about four minutes. It skirted north of Jarrell, missing the town but leaving behind a trail of mangled brush and scattered debris. For residents glued to weather radios or watching the sky, the threat felt real, but not yet personal. The main supercell, still drifting southwest, seemed content to test its power at the margins. Spotters along county roads watched the sky grow stranger. In the minutes after 3.35 p.m., multiple thin funnels dangled from the base of the storm, twisting and retracting, never quite settling into a single stable tornado. Some witnesses counted three or four at once, each flickering in and out of sight. The air was thick and electric, the light oddly dim for late afternoon. These rope funnels were short-lived, but their presence signaled something larger was brewing, an atmosphere straining at its limits. Survey teams would later debate what exactly happened in these moments. Some argued that the brief tornadoes were separate events, distinct from the main Jarrell F. Far. Others saw them as early fingers of the same evolving circulation, a single storm cycling through phases before unleashing its full force. The evidence was ambiguous. Ground scars overlapped, but the damage patterns shifted from chaotic to organized as the main tornado took shape. Volunteer spotters, many of them local farmers and amateur radio operators, played a crucial role in these tense minutes. Their updates, crackling over radio nets and sometimes breathless, gave forecasters and emergency managers precious lead time. They described the sky in plain urgent terms, multiple funnels, dust on the ground, rotation tightening. These warning shots, scattered across the landscape, were the last signposts before the storm found its focus. The atmosphere was giving every hint it could muster. The moment of truth was only minutes away. At 3.40 in the afternoon, northwest of Jarrell, a thin rope of swirling condensation twisted down from the supercell's churning base. In its first moments, the tornado looked almost fragile, like the earlier funnels that had flickered and vanished. But this was no fleeting apparition. Within seconds, the narrow column locked onto the ground, pulling in dust and debris as it spun across open pasture. Chasers parked along rural roads, radios crackling, watched as the tornado's outline sharpened and thickened. It was as if the storm, after hours of circling the boundary, had found its focus at last. Motorists on Interstate 35, just east of the forming tornado, slammed on their brakes. Traffic ground to a halt as drivers and truckers abandoned vehicles to stare westward. The tornado's path paralleled the interstate, never crossing it, but close enough that the roar and shifting debris were unmistakable. Amateur videographers and seasoned chasers alike scrambled for cameras. Scott Beckwith, perched on the shoulder with a camcorder, caught the tornado's rapid transformation on tape, a rare real-time record of a storm growing from a rope to a monster. The change was both sudden and relentless. In less than two minutes, the tornado broadened from a wiry filament to a wedge wider than half a mile. The condensation funnel thickened, the base darkened with soil, grass, and shattered fence posts. Eyewitnesses described a sound like a thousand waterfalls, punctuated by the snap of power lines and the groan of metal. 
the tornado's forward speed remained sluggish, just five miles per hour, allowing onlookers to study its structure in a way few storms ever permit. Some describe the main funnel as a wall, others as a boiling mass of rotating debris, its edges blurring into the haze of rain and flying earth. The transformation left no doubt, this was a monster. For storm chasers, the slow motion offered a rare chance to document every phase. Radios carried urgent warnings as the tornado's width and violence became clear. Law enforcement moved quickly to block access ramps, diverting traffic away from the threat. Along the interstate, drivers weighed the danger. Some reversed down the shoulder, others huddled beneath overpasses or watched from the cabs of idling trucks, transfixed by the spectacle unfolding just to the west. The slow pace gave observers time to see what normally happens too fast to register. Within minutes of touchdown, the tornado had already left its mark. Fences were uprooted, livestock scattered, and outbuildings shredded along rural roads. The wedge continued its crawl to the south-southwest, never hurrying, always broadening. The combination of its size, its visible power, and its unusual motion created a sense of mounting dread. For those who witnessed the birth of the Jarrell tornado, the memory would not fade. The storm announced itself not with speed, but with a relentless growing presence, a rope that became a monster, and a monster that was only beginning its work. As the tornado advanced toward Jarrell, its forward speed slowed even further, dropping below 5 miles per hour. Radar loops from that afternoon show the supercell crawling almost imperceptibly, locked onto the shallow boundary that had formed over central Texas. Instead of racing through the landscape, the tornado seemed to back its way into town, moving south-southwest, a direction that defied local expectations and left many residents unsure of its true path. This slow reverse approach meant that neighborhoods like Double Creek Estates were exposed to the core of the storm for an unusually long time. Residents who watched the sky from porches and open fields described a sequence that felt upside down. Instead of the usual hail and rain leading the way, the tornado itself arrived first, an immense rotating wall that darkened the horizon. Only after the funnel had passed did hail begin to fall, followed by a curtain of rain, and finally, the rush of cold outflow winds. For those inside Double Creek Estates, the tornado's approach felt almost surreal. The air went eerily still, the sky dropped to a deep, unnatural gray, and then the world outside vanished in a roar. Some survivors later recalled that the storm seemed to pause, hanging over their homes for minutes that felt endless. The impact of this stalled motion was catastrophic. With the tornado nearly stationary over the subdivision, wind speeds at ground level remained at their peak, well into the F5 range for nearly three full minutes. This prolonged exposure overwhelmed even the sturdiest houses, Structures that might have survived a brief encounter with a fast-moving tornado stood no chance against such relentless force. Radar and eyewitness timelines converge on a window between 3.48 and 3.51 p.m. when the core of the storm hovered over Double Creek. During that interval, appliances stopped, clocks froze, and the very foundations of homes were tested. The slow, backing motion of the tornado did not just define its track, it magnified the destruction turning what might have been a narrow path of damage into a wide swath of loss. For those caught inside, there was no quick escape, only the hope that their shelter would hold as the storm refused to move on. The aftermath of the Jarrell tornado left scars that went far beyond shattered homes and flattened trees. Survey teams arriving in Double Creek Estates found evidence rarely seen even in the world's worst tornado disasters. More than 525 feet of asphalt had been ripped from county roads, blacktop torn away in strips, exposing raw earth where a road had stood only minutes before. Grass and topsoil vanished, scoured clean down to the limestone. In places, the ground was stripped bare for hundreds of yards, a sign of the tornado's sustained grinding force. First responders and engineers walked a landscape where nearly every trace of human habitation had been erased. Foundations that once anchored houses were swept clean, with even sill plates, plumbing, and wiring torn out of the concrete. The debris left behind was almost unrecognizable. Wood splinters, fragments of vehicles, and bits of household items reduced to a fine, granular mix. Cars were missing or found mangled far from where they started. Trees, once marking property lines, stood as bare trunks or were uprooted entirely, 
their bark blasted away by wind and flying debris. The toll on life extended beyond the human tragedy. Nearly 300 head of cattle were killed, many thrown more than a quarter mile, their bodies scattered across fields and fence lines. The loss of livestock deepened the trauma for families whose livelihoods depended on those herds. Thirteen people were injured, some with wounds so severe that only the speed and skill of local EMS teams made survival possible. Yet for many, even the best sheltering efforts proved futile. The tornado's intensity at ground level was so extreme that, in the core destruction zone, survival above grade was nearly impossible. Warnings had gone out with about 10 to 12 minutes of lad time and local sirens sounded. Still, the slow, visible approach of the storm led some to watch rather than flee. Survey interviews later revealed a painful truth. Even with adequate warning, the combination of F5 wind speeds and prolonged exposure left almost no margin for error. Forensic engineers examining the site struggled to distinguish between the limits of construction and the absolute power of the storm. The Jarrell event became a benchmark for the upper limits of the original F scale, exposing how even well-built homes could be swept clean when a tornado stalls overhead. The landscape and the questions it raised lingered long after the winds had died. Today, Jarrell's vanished streets are a warning etched in meteorological textbooks, a reminder that even unlikely storms can rewrite the rules in minutes. Texas has not seen another F5 since, but record instability and erratic boundaries remain possible any spring. When the atmosphere breaks pattern, survival demands more than routine. The next lesson may arrive before we expect it. What would you do if the warning came today?